So the, and if I have enough time, I've already gone over a little bit, uh, I will then talk about what we call the dawn of the, of the universe of the epic of realization. So I believe the gamma reverse may be standardizable, although I'm not sure. It would be very good because then you let us probe the trajectory of the universe and check the baryon acoustic oscillations and go further, go into an even tighter kind of, kind of a period, uh, compare the, the, the baryon acoustic oscillations and the, and the supernova. But I believe it will be a probe of learning about how did the universe make the transition from being sort of uniform to when you had the first generation of stars and galaxies? Then that will be the, the kind of thing. So we've made a thing which has a horrible name, UFO, Ultra Fast Flash Observatory Pathfinder. And we have this huge collaboration from Korea to uh, France and Spain and uh, a few other places. And the idea is to try and study gamma ray bursts, and I'll explain to you the, the idea as we get later on, so we have time. But the gamma ray burst science in one slide, and then we'll go and talk about some of them, is they're the most energetic you know, events in the universe. The only thing more energetic that ever happened was the universe itself. Right? So they've been measured up to a redshift of 8.2, and in principle, they can be seen to a redshift of 12 if you have a sufficient detector and you're observing enough. So gamma ray bursts last between a millisecond and an hour. Depends on the gamma ray burst. That's why it's the word. And they put out photons that have been measured up to one GeV, which is the rest energy of a proton, the same amount of energy that the photon would be equivalent in gravitational pull to a, to a stationary proton. And the afterglow can be detected for weeks after a burst for some of them. It has a power law decay like curve in all bands for the long gamma ray bursts, not to define what a long gamma ray burst. The long type gamma ray bursts are associated with massive star collapse, and these are usually called type two supernova as opposed to the type 1A. So next next slide is an example of a gamma ray burst. So here's the spot, which is the gamma ray burst. <coughs> here's, here is the gamma rays from our galaxy. They're cosmic rays in our galaxy, and they collide with interstellar hydrogen, and occasionally you make pions, and they make gamma rays, or, or make positrons and then in gamma rays and so forth. So you get a, a fair flow of gamma rays in here, but every now and then you see the spot in the sky, and you'll notice the time in seconds, 10 seconds for this gamma ray from start to finish, and then you look at the number of counts in something that's like half a meter on the side. So it's very substantial. 30,000 gamma rays come right, in essentially two seconds, it's very, it's a very impressive kind of thing, considering this comes all the way across the universe. It's, it's, it's a very noticeable kind of thing. So there's been a whole series. I'll show you the most recent, the most current thing. There are been so far, actually more than now, more than 500. But this was a nice movie they made. <laughs> so these are the gamma ray bursts going off, and they're about one per day. And every time you see a little circle around one, that's one that they managed to swing the satellite around and point the telescope at so they can see it. So the music is maybe not so good. <laughs> so we're up to 180 of them. Right. And you can see that they don't get that many. But there they managed to catch one. But the gamma ray burst is going off. So there's a device on here which is triggering for gamma ray bursts. It's just a big open detector. And it's got a coated mask. People upstairs, two floors up, make these kind of things, big coated mask, and then you have a detector that detects gamma rays. And by the image of the coated mask on the gamma ray focal plane, you can tell where it's pointing, and then you try and move the telescope over to see it. And then every now and then you see it, and that was one where they managed to see it. And there's another one where they managed to see it. But almost all, almost every one that it saw was a long gamma ray burst. And the reason they did that satellite is there had been a, uh, a satellite uh, up that launched the same time as COBE. They were being built at the same uh, NASA center, Goddard Space Flight Center, and so I know I knew the PI of it very well, and we were always sort of jockeying for position and whatever, because the two satellites were being made to hit this gamma ray, uh, gamma ray observer. And on that was a thing called BASI, which is a large area uh, trigger. and this is the distribution of gamma ray bursts that we're seeing on the sky. So it's just 
nearly 3,000 gamma ray bursts that we're seeing by that satellite. And the argument is they're extremely uniform in the sky. That means they must be extra galactic. That was the primary kind of thing. So people were seeing these gamma ray bursts. They were originally detected much earlier by satellites that were put up by the United States to see who was doing nuclear testing. And it turns out the universe is doing nuclear testing much more than people on the Earth. And so the people who were, who were doing nuclear verification were then allowed to publish that they discovered these and then that built up eventually to the satellite which was launched in uh, 1989 or 90. And after a few years, it collected this kind of observation. And, uh, and that made people conclude there were, in fact, famous debates. There have been series of debates on astronomy over time, but one of them was on whether gamma ray bursts were galactic or extra galactic. But by the time these sissies came in, everyone agreed it was so uniform that it had to be extremely local, which they were not, or they had to be very far away. But it wasn't until uh, after this was done and after uh, there got to be quite often on many satellites gamma ray burst detectors that there got to be a network and uh, an Italian satellite, Beppo Sachs, actually managed to catch one of the gamma ray bursts and see the afterglow. That was the first one where they could measure the redshift and prove that what's going on. And there were a couple of them that did it. And then that led to the SWIFT satellite, which is now seven years in orbit and near the end of its lifetime. Okay, so what do we know about gamma ray bursts? There are two main types, right? The circles are there to guide your eye, but this is the time to 90% of the burst in seconds, right? So you'll see some of the bursts are all over in a second, 90% done in a second, and some take hundreds of seconds, right? And then this is a ratio of the flux in the, in the 10 to 300 kV range to the 25 to 100 kV range. So this is a, you know, just a, a measure of how, how energetic or how hard the, the burst is. And the claim is they fall into two, two clearly distinct categories. Clearly there's a big concentration here. You know, you can argue whether it's a tail or a concentration here. But generally the people in the field divided the, the 2,000 bats, you know, burst into the two categories. And so they call them the long gamma ray burst, and they tend to be long, much longer in time with a typical characteristic time scale of 20 seconds, and they have a softer spectrum. And the short gamma ray burst, whose time scale is less than two seconds, typically four tenths of a second, and they're in the harder X ray spectrum. They tend to be more energetic in terms of what's going on. And uh, so then the question is, what are these? Right? And no one knows for sure. But there's strong evidence that the, the long ones are the results of, of type two supernova, that the supernova somehow has a jet. So here are the prejudicial, this, this is prejudice, this is theory, as opposed to actual observations. The long gamma ray bursts, the ones that are more than two seconds in duration, we believe a red giant star or a fairly substantial star collapses onto its core. So this is called core collapse supernova. And they're the ones that either make neutron stars or black holes. The assumption here is it's probably a black hole. They become so dense that there's a bounce and the outer shell is blown off. And in fact, the neutrino flux, the neutrino pressure is an important part of causing that shell to blow out. And the end, you're, you have some kind of a black hole in which material is being fed in. And there are two relativistic jets that come out in opposite directions. So what do I mean by relativistic jet? I mean something where the gamma factor is much greater than one. Right? So this is be becoming like a particle accelerator, only these are very substantial in scale. Some of these are very substantial in scale. And there are some galactic centers that have accelerators that are, are quite massive and quite energetic. The short gamma ray burst, the theorist's favorite model, but by no means proven, is there are two compact objects or, you know, orbiting each other. Usually they use neutron stars because these Exactly, but it could be a neutron star and a black hole, or even two black holes, although you'd like to have some material. They eventually radiate away gravitational energy so that they very quickly coalesce and merge, and they will form a black hole, because the two neutron stars will be over their critical, over their degeneracy mass, and they will collapse to a black hole. But some material has to be ejected and thrown out because of the energy issues and rotational angular momentum issues. And again, you get two relativistic jets that go out back to back relatively perpendicular to the plane of the infall of material. 
And so I have, I have a theory about why that is, but there are computer models. So I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to show you a little bit of a, another little movie about this. But we're going to cons consider that we have two neutron stars. Now, neutron stars generally have very high magnetic fields. Why? They came from something like our own sun that has a magnetic field, but it's collapsed from being a million kilometers in diameter to being 10 kilometers in diameter. So the magnetic, the area, it just takes the magnetic field with it. So the area has gone up by, by a factor of 10 to the 10th. So the magnetic field can easily get up to 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 15th gauss. So there's very strong magnetic fields just get entrained in the collapse of the of forming a neutron star. So the two neutron stars are going to be orbiting each other, and they are going to merge, and they're going to have a density. And so I'll show you the movie. They'll have a, a density, and they'll also have a magnetic field. And one of the issues is the magnetic field lines have to form a nice column in order to have the jets come out. Right? So like, one of the questions is how that happens. So recently there have been some uh, nice computer simulations. And then NASA makes these nice promos, but this is actually Max Planck Institute. So it's just a set every day or two. So there's about one gamma ray burst per day in the universe, or in our observable universe. So this is a simulation of the accretion disk in the neutron star. density and magnetic field. notice there's actually a jet going out the back, but because of the relativistic Doppler effect, it looks very much fainter. You get beaming and you get boost in the direction towards you and you get, it gets much fainter in the direction going the other way. If the gamma is a factor of 100, it's a very huge difference between the beam going towards you and the beam going away from you. And they only last a short time and then they decay very quickly because the amount of matter that was in the neutron star gets heated very fast, but it, it's also been puffed up, so it's optically thin, so it can radiate its energy very quickly. So that's the idea. And so 
it's complicated. This is a theory that I have, which I haven't had time to work out, or, or another math work out. But so you, if you think about the neutrons, if you think about a black hole that's rotating around like this, because it has an accretion, accretion disk like that, why do the jets come out that way? Okay. How do you how do you imagine the jets should come out? And you know why should matter be ejected out at relative speeds at right angles to the to that? Right. So one of the one of the issues is how the magnetic fields get trapped in the black hole, and one of the other issues is very straightforward. So think about if you have a magnetic field line that was going out like this. What's the velocity of the magnetic field line if the neutron started rotating around? Well, the velocity is simply going to equal to omega times the radius, right? Mm -hmm. And there'll be a, a light cone radius, right? Because if you just go out far enough, if omega is very fast, that the black hole is rotating in some tiny, you know, neutron stars often do a millisecond, or often when they're formed around a millisecond. A black hole should be about a factor of 10 faster, so that should be a tenth of a millisecond. So the omega should be, you know, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth. So if omega, if this is on the order of 10 to the 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, you don't have to go out very far before you're the light cone. And so the magnetic field lines, even if they come out like this, must go up like that. They must eventually avoid the light cylinder. But there's another thing. Suppose that I have the accretion disk that's coming in like that, and the particle is wanting to spiral in. Okay. So if I look at if I look at a black hole, this you know, haven't had to have But if you have a, a normal black hole, there's a singularity in the center, and there's a horizon, and it's all spherical. But if you have a rotating black hole, the equal potential is going to be set by the total acceleration, right, which is the gravitational attraction, plus the centripetal force outwards. Right? So that, that black hole is going to have a ergosphere like this, right? Which is the is the equipotential. So that if I'm trying to feed, if it's rotating a lot around this axis, it will, it's just like the Earth is oblate, and the Sun is oblate. The black hole, the, the the horizon of the black hole will be oblate. Seems kind of strange, but that's that's the way it will be, and there will be a singularity. Now, but now instead of being in a single, it'll actually be a circle in the center. This is also another strange solution, but when you do when you solve the equation. But that's not so important. So there's an inner horizon where you can't ever get back, and then there's the thing, this is called the ergosphere, from which a particle can actually be stationary. So if a particle is feeding in, there's a thing called the Penrose, part, Penrose process, if a particle comes in this ergosphere, it can send one of its particles inside with negative energy and it can have positive energy and go shoot out. So this is called the Penrose process. And I believe this must happen. I believe that when these black holes form, they must be rotating very rapidly, both because they're being fed material or because they were from rotating neutron stars. Now, because they were the spins of the neutron stars like this when they merge, or were they like this when they merge? There's, now there's more configurations, it gets more complicated. So now if I'm a particle and I want to come out, I want to come out in this direction, not in the not in the vertical direction, but there's frame dragging. So one of the things you'll learn is not only the space bit warped, but the space itself, the local inertial frame, is set by the, by the sum of the matter energy around it. And so it actually drags the particles with it. So that if I go out, I will actually be drug out like that. And if there are magnetic field lines, I'll be quickly channeled up and out that direction. So that's my theory, is you have to do a double calculation. You have to calculate the Penrose process, you have to calculate the frame dragging, and then you have to calculate the magnetic fields. And then you can maybe predict what a jet is. So there's a theoretical problem here <laughs> that's, that's extensive mathematical calculations to be done. And I hope we'll find somebody who's, a, who's, a, who's going to want to be doing that kind of calculation. So it's a, it's a more complicated process. This is one of the reasons that I think, unless you can understand it very carefully, it could be hard to calibrate what what the brightness of the you know what the absolute brightness of gamma ray burst is, because it matters whether you're on right on the beam or at the edge of the beam. It also matters how did that matter go in and how did it come back out. So all right. So this artist concept. 
Right, so here's a little bit of the fun part. There was a, a place where believe, people believe there was an exoplanet near a place that went to a gamma ray burst. It would not be good to be in that neighborhood, okay? Because you can imagine if you get 30,000 gamma rays in two seconds across the universe, that if it's next door, it's not so, so very good. So you can kind of imagine it might look like that. You know, here's the gamma ray burst. Here's the planet. It's all on fire on this side. <laughs> it's really hot on that side, right? It's only safe places, the antipode, right? And so, in fact, there's a great game. <laughs> this should be a video game and learning tool <laughs> called, uh, you know, Animal Armageddon. <laughs> so there is an actual thing called Animal Armageddon, and this is the, you know, the atmosphere of the of the Earth, right? And this is for North and South Americans, right? To be, you know, going to eliminate the rainforest and the oxygen on the Earth by, by any with a gamma ray burst. But there it turns out there's a lot of ways that people can die, so it's an eight-part mini-series, right? <laughs> because you can get wiped out by meteors, you can get wiped out by next door supernova, you can get wiped out by a gamma ray burst. So there's uh, various things. But there's one speculation that there were these great sea creatures. Let's see what it should say in here. Uh, all right, well, who knows? I'll put it, on, I have it on this thing. So it, it seems it's possible that gamma rays from space may be responsible for the extinctions of the over the over the Ocean period, which was roughly 480 million years ago, when 70% of the life in the sea died. Right? So it wasn't enough to be in the ocean, right? You 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 had to be deep in the ocean <laughs> to have a good chance. I mean, this tells you gamma ray bursts were not so cool, right? But this is this is a very famous thing. This is the giant, uh, you know, a giant nautilus creature. I thought it was mentioned in here. Oh, the, nod the nautiloid, right? that's what this is, the nautiloid. Right? It's a giant thing that was the main predator in the, in the early sea. So you, you got to watch out that, you know, we're not the whole Earth. You know, the gamma ray bursts at the North Pole. It's, it's bad for, you know, Western civilization. <laughs> this is a nice artist drawing of the, but it won't be a nice, you know, just one single cousin gray shower. It'll be like a zillion of them, right? So it's pretty bad. <laughs> so you can get the you know the floods and the asteroids and everything else. So the short I have to emphasize the short gamma ray burst origin is really not known. It's associated now in theorist minds, just like in theorist minds, the standard model part is associated with the Higgs. We'll know in a year or so whether there's a Higgs or not. And you know there are a number of issues, right? And uh, but it also means. It's possible that you could, if you could do gamma ray burst and gamma and gravity wave observations at the same time, you might be able to figure out what was going on. And so here is a, an example of a gamma ray burst. And you know that you're warping space time when you put matter and energy in it. If you put two really massive compact objects in near orbit around each other, they are causing space to be rippled, and you'll get this set of waves coming out from their orbiting. And their orbits very quickly, because of spending so much energy in making these gravity waves, distorting space time, that their, their orbits go in, they become more rapid, they generate waves more quickly, and they very quickly come to the point to where they're starting to touch and coalesce it, and they ring down in terms of what's happening. And so you can tell a lot. So here's so showing you the thing. It's fairly stable orbit when it's far out, but it's slowly losing energy. As it gets in closer, it very quickly starts to lose more and more energy. The amplitude of the waves get bigger, and then it coalesces, and then and it's pretty much over. And you can then, you know, here's a black hole that caused star murder, and it has this characteristic shape, and then it ring, it'll ring down. And this is the, the details further in. But you can tell it between a black hole and a neutron star murder and so forth, provided you could make really tight observations at this ring down in this, this part of the time. Right? So here's another example with two neutron stars merging where you have a d double ring down going on. And there's also the possibility it could be that a, you could think a gamma ray burst could be a star coming too close to a black hole, which happens in our galactic, in our galactic center eventually. There are stars that are orbiting relatively close around whatever black holes in the center. And, but the problem you have is that you will have this tidal stripping that you actually start tidally distorting and pulling the star in. So you, you, you don't have, it's hard to make a burst narrow from just absorbing and swallowing a star. It's uh, whatever. 
Right. And there's one more possibility for the people who just don't like the fact that neutron stars are, you know, the, the gamma ray bursts are really spread out. So there is a, a speculation that there are some very, very short gamma ray bursts. And so the, the question is whether there are black hole evaporation bombs. So back in the old days, in 1971, Zell Dubich had a suggestion that black holes might evaporate. And Stephen Hawking visited, and then in 93, he published this paper about how black holes could radiate and, uh, you know, have uh, that kind of stuff. And so now you look at this curve of the time to 90% of the, of the light being put out, and here are the long gamma ray bursts and the short gamma ray bursts, the maybe two populations. And the claim is there might be one more here, right? Unfortunately, the focus isn't very good, but that's at a fraction of a tiny fraction of a second. You can see here the time in seconds, here's a tenth of a second. It's all over in a few hundredths of a second, right? So what, happen what happens? Well, the black hole evaporates because the temperature is proportional to one over its mass, and it radiates as the temperature of the fourth power. So it becomes a bomb, and it just shoots out a huge amount of energy, but there's residual hot matter left because it shot all, it evaporated all these particles, and they take a little while to decay, but they're optically thin, so they decay fairly quickly. So this dotted line here is the theoretical curve for a black hole evaporation, right? And then this is the data point from the average of these three guys that might be in that peak, right? And so the, uh, there was a paper by Klein and Odowinski claiming that they've discovered a black hole evaporation this is going to be interesting to see if it actually happens or not. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And so then we have another idea. So it would be swifter than swift, right? Faster than swift. And that is the with swift, they use the gamma ray burst detector to locate the gamma ray, the X-ray gamma ray burst by using this this uh, you know coded mass aperture and then a focal plane and then you look for the pattern. That tells you where to point, and then you rotate the spacecraft. And the problem with rotating the spacecraft is you can't rotate the spacecraft very fast and settle it so you can get a good optical image. It just takes 60 to 70 seconds in the best situation, unless you happen to be looking in the right direction to start with. So we have the concept of not steering the spacecraft, but steering the beam. And rather than, you know, so we first thought about moving the telescope, and we said that's not so good. We'll just move the beam by having it. A gimbal mirror. Right? So you just move the mirror. So you can move the mirror much faster than you can move the telescope. So it's a very simple idea, right? Move, move, move the beam right? instead of moving the, move the whole spacecraft. Now, people don't like to move things on spacecraft because things can go wrong and it's got to survive through launch, but that's another issue. So we had a different idea about that. And so we put together a Pathfinder mission and we were given or asked for whatever it is, 20 kilograms on the Russian Lomonosov, which is the University of Moscow, and Lomonosov is uh, in, in three weeks or four weeks will be the 300th anniversary of him. He's a famous scientist, just like the Swedes just had the 300th anniversary when they're famous naturalists and so forth. So they were planning to launch in commemoration of the 300th anniversary a uh, Lomonosov satellite, and on that we were given 20 kilograms and 20 watts of power it's not much, but we were given that. And there are some other experiments that are on there. And I have another picture, so we don't even know exactly where we're sitting because in this picture we're sitting up there. <laughs> it's approximately that way. And then we just had to convince them to not point it at the sun because looking at the sun is bad for your optical telescope. And, uh, or we have to have, we, that's why I have the channel and we have the mirror, we can move it so we look, send the sun back to itself rather than send it to our optical system but there's a lot of things that we have to, to, to figure out. And my colleague, Gil Park, who's a professor at, in IWA, is, our, is our, our PI, and we're doing it out of that. So the concept is very simple. We have a coated mask, and we have a focal plane, and we look for the pattern on the coated ma of a coated mask in order to tell what's going on. Then we have an optical telescope and a gimbal steering mirror and baffles to keep the sun out of the system, and that's the whole the whole basic idea of what's going on. And the tricky thing is to put the electronics here and over here just in order to have a closed system and have it all protected. And so here are some of the components that we were building uh, last spring. 
So this is the telescope where there is a, a primary, a secondary, and then the, and the focal plane where this stuff goes on. Here's the gimbal mirror. Here's some of the electronics. Some of the electronics was built here in this lab and at Law yeah. in Orsay. And here are three of the graduate students. Right? You'll notice something unusual about this. They're all women. Right? Well, in France, it's not so unusual. But, it's a, but in fact, five of the seven graduate students who are working on this project are, are women. So, but that's partly because the Iwa University was founded. Uh, Yonsei was founded as a men's college, and Iwa was founded as a women's college. And though Yonsei is completely integrated, you know, Iwa undergraduate is still mostly uh, mostly women. Just a very few men. So in the class I taught there, I had 25 women and one man <laughs> in the class. Right? So here is the gimbal, the gimbal mirror and the telescope, and this is a mock-up of the of the, the burst detector in our clean in the clean room that we have in there. And then we have an outer clean room where they're building the light, where they're building the precision electronics. So you can see another one of the grad students without the stuff. Here's one of the male, one of the few male grad students, <laughs> and here they're building the the, doing the software programming for some of the aspects. This is the this is a fiber testing. I just put this. This is in the same part of the clean room. A fiber testing setup for the big boss and for the boss. These are boss fibers that are being tested there. So well, let me let me go back and say a little bit about that because I did. So in order to do the survey, if you want to measure a million galaxies a, a year or 10 million a year, depending on what you want to do. You, you do it by having a big focal plane, and then you want to be able to take 5,000 galaxies at once and run them to spectrographs. So you, you do is you have fibers that you can move in the focal plane to be on the image of the galaxy and take that light into your spectrograph. And so you need these optical fibers to do that. So this is becoming a, a sort of a particle physics scale experiment. So here is the coded mass aperture <coughs> that, that's going on. It's coded in order to be structurally strong because it would be lightweight. So it's a high Z material so that X-rays and gamma rays are blocked in one place and through, and then there's a plastic cover and a frame to hold it up. And so this is the scale size you see. It's, it's a hand, so this is roughly twice the real size. And this is the whole thing set up with the coated mask on the top and the focal plane and the electronics on the bottom. Right? And it's all just structurally put together. And the burst, and the burst alert telescope, you're having a burst of photons coming through they make, they go through and they make a pattern and you see where that pattern appears and that tells you the angle in the sky. So there's different approaches to thinking about how it is. You, you can have different kinds of masks and then where you see the pattern on your focal plane, you can reconstruct the angle where you were on the sky. And then we put in a proposal for something that we call UFO 100. I still didn't like the name and Bruce didn't like the name so we called it ZG for X-ray and IR gamma ray burst instrumentation. But it's the same idea, a larger photo, you know, coated mask and a focal plane, more complicated focal plane, a steering mirror, a bigger telescope with a big infrared camera too. So you do UV optical and infrared. We don't have infrared yet. And the reason is you'd like to see a, through the material around the gamma ray burst if there is material around the gamma ray burst. And so that's the thing we're doing. So this is science about it <coughs> and the future kind of activities. So one of the things that we had in mind was using uh, uh, electronically movable mirrors. And there is a, a project that in, the, in one of the laboratories at Iowa University to make two axis movable mirrors so that you can do it instead of in, in one second, which is how fast we can see the mirror, do it in a millisecond. And you do it by a whole plane of little mirrors, and then you steer them all. And so the basic concept is a hybrid concept that you have your plate stored like this. When you see a source, well, not supposed to be the sun, but when you see a gamma ray burst, you you steer it so that it points to the detector, and then you steer the whole after this after a little a few observations made, you see the whole thing. And the reason you do it this way is to see the image very quickly, is locate it very quickly, but you have diffraction off of all these edges, right? Because the diffraction is set by the size of the mirrors. So if you then flatten them and go back, you can get back your whole point spread function. So you can essentially get there in roughly about a millisecond with a sensitivity of about two arc minutes. And then you can go down after a second to about to about one arc second in terms of responsibility. And you should be able to scan over about a degree field. That's the kind of theory that we have for, for a satellite. 
And so why is our rapid response needed? Well, if you want to measure the bulk Lorentz factor, which is one of the ways you can calibrate them, we, you have a theoretical relationship between the Lorentz factor, which would be small gamma or capital gamma, in this case came through in the wrong font, and the, and the time, you find that if you have at 100, you have up to 1,000 seconds to make the measurements before things fade away. But if you have a Lorentz factor that's about 1,000, you only have 10 seconds to get over there. And so SWIFT usually takes about this long to get there, so it's only measuring this outer part of the tail. But if you really want to calibrate things, you need to do this. But it depends upon exactly what's going on in the, in the gamma ray burst, and people don't really understand. There are lots of models, but there's very little data. And so there are predictions that there is an internal, there is the, the original burst, there's an internal shock in a prompt X-way curve, and then there's an external shock when you start the, the material in here, it begins to run into the material that's in the accretion disk outside. And so you get a series of things to, to, to try and understand what the light curve might be like. Right? And uh, so most of the data that exists are way out in this part of the, of the curve that, that people just can't get to see the, uh, the, you know, what's going on. And to get the calibration, you know, to get the calibration is difficult. But in principle, the, the peak luminosity should be related to the rise time if you can measure it precisely. That's why you want to measure it. Uh, very well, but the question is how well, how good a correlation is this really when you make all the corrections and you understand it, will it come out that way? Will, will in fact, you ever be able to make this diagram and be able to trust it that, that you could tell the difference between this thing and the cosmological constant? That's the, the question. And the, the question is interesting because you don't have any very good ways to probe back path to a redshift of eight. I mean, with the, with the periodic acoustic inflations, we probably can get out to a redshift of two, but in here, it's going to be very difficult. And by, by the time you get to eight, it'll be nearly impossible to do that. And you'd also like to make multi-messenger measurements. You'd like to see neutrinos, but particularly you'd like to see gravity waves as well as the, the X-ray and optical at the same time in order to see what's going on. So the only other picture I have is the is a famous check, I think it's a check band, GRB. They're a heavy metal acid rock, I think. <laughs> yeah, enough. <laughs> this is the part of the lecture you like the best.